David? Hey, Al. Yeah. Okay. Hello to everybody. This is Alan Blumkin. No bottle. We'll have to take this one, okay? Yeah. Uh, this is another edition of the uh, David Nemec's History and Trivia show. I'm the host, and my guest today, as I just mentioned, is David Nemec, who is, uh, among, other th- among other things, the authority on the 19th century. Welcome, David. Welcome. A very pl- a pleasure to be back with you once again, Al. Thank you. Uh, because of the short notice, I didn't invite anyone else. But no, but okay. uh, I'll, 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 I'll uh, message him that uh, yeah, we'll be back maybe once a week, once every two weeks. Yeah, that would okay. be great. Okay. Uh, you start. But- well, we get to, I, you know, let's say, uh, I uh, was one who did not really believe we'd have a baseball season this year. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe I was a bit gloomier than uh, I had any right to be because uh, we're now nearing the halfway point in the season. And although there certainly has been a COVID problem, and it's definitely dampened the chances of quite a few teams of having even a reasonable shot at the playoffs. Uh, we do appear as if we're going to finish. And uh, the season, uh, as everyone predicted, is marked with a lot of weird stuff. But uh, one of my observations that may not have been dealt with a whole lot lately uh, is about the Cleveland Indians. Uh, The Indians are currently uh, rated as over a 90% chance, given over a 90% chance, chance of making the playoffs. Uh, I believe they have a 17 and 11 record at the and moment. And they play Minnesota the next few nights. And they play Minnesota the next three nights, and that's going yeah. to tell a lot. Because uh, Minnesota is a, has been in first place most of the season, and it's definitely a playoff lock, I think. Uh, Cleveland has shot itself in the foot with COVID because the two, uh, two pitchers, um, big, big um, a big part of their rotation, uh, Plezak and uh, Mike Clevenger uh, went out uh, went out while in Chicago uh, when they shouldn't have from the hotel after a game, and uh, were caught doing so. And their uh, reaction after they were caught was not what the team was looking for, and they've since been optioned uh, to the minors. And uh, the Cleveland rotation, as a result, is, is now uh, facing a bit of a struggle. And whether they'll come back or not uh, remains to be seen. Uh, they may even be traded because the team is pretty down on them for what they did, rightfully yeah. so, I think. This kid and, McKenzie looked very good the other night. McKenzie uh, started yeah. Saturday night, but uh, I was reading an article today about Cleveland pitchers in the past, who had a tremendous first game, and what the, what, what happened to them? There was a guy named Paul Rigdon, uh, not that long ago, who had a great first start against the Yankees, and uh, he's a name probably very few in our audience here are going to recognize, even though most of them have followed baseball more closely than we have in the last few years. Uh, it, in any case, the Indians uh, have something very strange going on. At, the pre- at present, um, they have a 208 team batting average, and uh, their pitching has been lights out. They're, I think, leading the majors in a lot of pitching departments. Uh, meanwhile, what we're staring at is a version uh, of a team that may even be worse than the hitless wonders, the uh, 1906 Chicago White Sox, which won the team, which won the American League pennant with a team batting average of 230. Now, to make 230 this year, the Indians are going to have to hit around 250 the rest of the way. And right now, that doesn't look too promising because most of their hitters are down below 250 and several are below the Mendoza line. And these are their starters. Uh, There is nobody riding the bench uh, currently injured who's ready to step in and do anything uh, to alleviate that. 
their trade prospects are going to require them to give up somebody like McKenzie in order to get somebody who can swing the bat decently. So we're looking at a team that might make the playoffs with a team batting average around 215, maybe maybe at the highest 220. Oh, and, not uh, the only, they're not that's the only very, team that's down there. Yeah, I know. There's other yeah. teams that are down there, too. The Pirates are very, very poor in hitting. And uh, the Pirates don't have the pitching to make up for it. So, as a result, um, they're doing, uh, you know, they're not doing at all with what was expected. They won three and, games over the weekend. They swept the Brewers, which shocked the heck out of me. It shocked everybody. Yeah. It shocked everybody. No, and the, especially the Brewers, who are, were considered pretty much of a lock for the playoffs. And now they've had... They've been affected by COVID because they had games with the Cardinals that were had to be postponed. And uh, <clears throat> the Cardinals are, as a result, going to have to play a lot of double hitters not down the line. And, no. uh, yeah, what happened uh, over the weekend was the old Yankees-Mets uh, series was postponed because of one Met who was unidentified at this point showed up with the uh, test, tested positive. And so uh, they're, they're speculating in the newspaper how they're going to take care of that. And they, they're supposed to play, this was supposed to be at City Field. The series coming up this weekend uh, is, excuse me, is uh, uh, scheduled to be Yankee Stadium. So far, there are two, going to be two double headers. And the third game, they're looking to find a uh, common open date to schedule a double header then. But wow. uh, what's happening is that the, uh, uh, to me, which really uh, sets me that the team that has no cases, like whoever's playing the Cardinals, the Dolphins, I'm sorry, the Marlins, and the uh, Mets, uh, the other team has nobody testing positive, and they're getting screwed. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy, and uh, you know, and, there were, and as a result, these double headers too. We've talked about this, I know, between you and me. Uh, you know, the, the the second game is like a seven game, seven inning affair, and that's you know, I they did that. Games are. Really, they, yeah, both games are seven, both games are seven innings. I've been doing it. Well, you have you, yeah, you you only pay, you only have fourteen innings, and uh, instead of eighteen innings, and it really. Uh, requires your starter only to go four, four and a third, four and a half, you know, four and two thirds innings, and then maybe bring in a couple of relievers that really saves on your pitching. So it's actually an advantage for some of these teams who who don't have deep bullpens to be playing these double headers, and it, it's an unfair advantage given that uh, other teams uh, who haven't had any COVID problems and have been fortunate enough to escape escape any when they're playing does, uh, as a result, they're having to play full nine-inning games, and their pitching staffs are being uh, more are more quickly depleted as a result. Oh, I remember so the good old days of the sporting news, probably going back at least 50 years, when I used to carry the AAA box scores. And the, you know, in there, there would be doubleheaders, because they scheduled the number of them back then. And uh, you, you, I saw both seven inning games, and I couldn't I, I didn't re- believe what I was reading. But apparently, this has been used in the minor leagues forever. It was, yeah, it was used in the major leagues too um, in the 1890s and the first decade or so of the 20th century, uh, when teams had to catch a train, and uh, it was late in the afternoon, and it was nearly you know. The first game had gone uh, longer than expected. The second game was changed to a seven-inning game. And sometimes they didn't even get to seven innings. Uh, there were games, I think, that finished only, you know, only required six innings. And at that time, they weren't suspended games. It had to be um, finished at, at a later date. So there were, there were some seven-inning no-hitters and uh, that have been washed out of the books. They, they used to be recorded. Uh, the early editions of Macmillan counted seven inning no hitters as no as 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 uh, favorably as a nine inning no hitter or even a ten or eleven inning no hitter. 
uh, and you know, the early McMillan's also kind of any no hitter that lasted nine innings, regardless of whether it was broken up in the tenth or eleventh or whatever. So, but those games now are are lost to uh, followers of, of things like no hit games because unless you have early editions of of the McMillan, uh, I don't know if there's any place you can really find them. Uh, and and some of them are you know really excellently pitched games and key games in the pennant races. There's play those actually uh, the record book that they put out every year used to have them because uh, you know the Hardy Hacks game is the primary example. The 12 perfect innings and uh, you know the 13th he lost the game in the 13th because yeah Paris that was score right either. either. But there's been a number of those, and the one they had there, which I thought was absolutely ridiculous, they gave Mike McCormick a five-inning no-hitter at the top of the sixth inning, which he has from got a hit. But the game was rained out and reverted to uh, five innings. Yeah. So they, they still yeah. gave him credit for another, you know, until that whole thing was done away with. Of course, they also did away with uh, Ernie Shaw's perfect game. They may just made a simple no-hitter. Because he didn't start the game, and the man did get on base when Ruth walked the first batter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he is credited with, he's still credited with a shutout. Yeah. Uh, and uh, But he isn't credited with a complete game. <laughs> so... Because the first batter was, was uh, Babe Ruth faced the first hitter. Yeah. Um, it was the starting pitcher. So uh, there are a lot of weird things like this in the record book. So uh, for younger fans who really rely heavily on what's online, baseball ref and so forth, uh, and don't uh, have access to older record books or uh, the curiosity to seek uh, out the history of the game uh, as you and I know it um, because we're both dinosaurs in comparison to younger fans today but uh, they really are missing out on something because there are, there are a lot of very oddity uh, you know a great number of oddities uh, that were on the, in the record book and have since been expunged uh, I think it's unfortunate because it's just, they were part of the game then they were counted then as no hitters. Yeah, uh, it's like it's like in 1887, bases on balls are, were counted as hits. Uh, and now four it's, strikes a year, right? Four strikes and you're out that season. Yeah, four strikes yeah. and you were out, and and uh, so as a result, there were fewer short pitching strikeouts, and a lot more a lot more players getting batting over 400 because their walks were counted as hits. Uh, the record books have since deducted those walks. They still count the walks as walks. And, uh, but there was one edition of Total Baseball that did count the walks as hits. And it did count and credited the pitchers with giving up a hit instead of a walk. So as a result, you saw things like you know batting averages and whips in that particular edition of Total Baseball, which is not something that the editors of Total Baseball wanted, believe me. But Major League Baseball foisted it on them, and they had no choice but to include these records, the records the way Major League Baseball dictated they were at the time. Uh, that stance has since changed, but there are a lot of inconsistencies still in the record books. Uh, games that were declared forfeited games and the stats were thrown out still hold true for certain years, but not for others. Uh, so there are stats from forfeited games included in uh, the record books for 1890. But when you go into the teens, the early teens, uh, up through, 19, I think, 1919, uh, any forfeited game that had to be replayed, the stats, the stats were thrown out. And as a result, uh, it cost one player a batting title. And uh, there's really some strange things. And uh, I encourage, you know, even younger fans especially to – you know, check up on, you know, rules books and record books, and you'll find things out about the game that, uh, you know, this year is certainly very strange, but you'll see there have been strange things in, in years past, too. 
Yeah, there, there, there used to be an outfielder who had a very average career named Rusty Torres. And he played the big three in the 70s. He was with the Yankees when that uh, last game in Washington before they moved to Texas was forfeited. He was at uh, Ten Cent Beer Night in Cleveland. And he was at Disco Demolition Night in, uh, in the White Sox Park. And uh, that uh, second game of that doubleheader was forfeited <laughs> because the field was a little bit unplayable. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, to say the least. That's, yeah. that's a, so I, I, so I went, Paul found this out, I posted it. I said he won a, uh, he won the Triple Crown. <laughs> I've been to all three of those events. Yeah, it's, uh, you don't see stuff like that anymore, fortunately. Like, it was beer night in Cleveland, and <clears throat> I think it was 1975, and uh, a 10 cents for a cup of beer. And uh, by the ninth inning, um, the crowd was so unruly when coming on the field, the umpires stopped the game with Cleveland uh, on the verging on winning and uh, forfeited the game to Texas. And Billy Martin at the time commented, you know, this, I, this, this, is, this is really scary. I've never been as scared in, in baseball as I have being in the dugout as manager of the Rangers for, 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 this, for this game. And, uh, you know, that's, now that kind of stuff doesn't go on. They're a little more careful about how they schedule these events. And they don't provide balls or bats and things like that. That's in yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I attended a game of Milwaukee. Uh, this was 1971. Or two when I had 10 cent beer night. And they knew how to handle it. Because that's their second favorite in those. What? And that town. Yeah, yeah. I believe now they stopped selling um, alcohol at ballparks in the seventh inning, don't they? Yeah. So, yeah. So that that was as a result of the Cleveland Texas game. Uh, they finally caught on that this wasn't going to fly. So, um, but you know, getting back to this year, it's 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 there's there are going to be all kinds of very fluky things. Uh, it's very unlikely any pitcher is even going to win 10 games, I think. I'd be very surprised if there were 10 games. I think you have three with five. Well, yeah, three with five a, right now? Yeah, one is, a, one is Shane Bieber. Oh, uh, that's right. With, yeah, with Cleveland, he's 5-0. Yeah. Uh, uh, he, you, you Darvish, of all people, won his fifth game yesterday. With? With the Cubs. With the Cubs. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. One of the Cubs, yeah. And, teams like uh, teams that are doing, yeah, they uh, teams are doing, an, you know, like, an incredible amount of injuries. Yeah, I just on the Yankees alone, they lost uh, most of their starting team uh, for various leg pulls. Yeah, that's leg pulls, yeah. and uh, you know, my brother is a big Yankee fan, and he says that their training methods have to be horrible. Because it does just, make you wonder what they were doing when they when they called the teams back to uh, a mini spring training before, um, you know, the, re- the restart to the season, and um, yeah, because there have been an awful lot of injuries. I'm, I think almost every team has somebody out, and um, I don't know how many perfect game or how many complete games have there been so far. Do you have any? I answer? think five. I, I somebody put that up on. One of the groups I'm in. Five, there's, there's three shutouts. Complete game shutouts. Three shutouts. Wow. Yeah, that's impressive. The, the first I day, there I, was a... When it started, there was a complete game pitch by uh, Carl Hendricks of the Cubs. Complete game shutout. On opening day. Opening wow. day. I, and oh, I, my, you know, my, I some of my friends and I set the, the over-under for the season at 10. Complete games. I was looking at all the box scores from yesterday. There weren't any. The 14 games, yeah. there weren't any. Yeah, I think, as, yeah, as, as the season uh-huh. goes, it's, uh, yeah, up, yeah, so we got five so far. With So we're, we'll probably be lucky to have a dozen if we, you know, at, yeah. uh, at, at the end of the season. And probably the leader, uh, there might be 10 guys tied with two. 
Uh, it's yeah. Been, uh, uh, you know, something like that. Because and last year, the top guy had three. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's... So I don't know what to say. I mean, I... You know, it's... it's um, I'm glad to see they got back on the field. Um, you know, I'm sorry to see that some some players did not take COVID as seriously as they should have, and as a result, their their uh, you know their carelessness is affecting their team's chances. And I just hope that we do finish the season and there are no further casualties. And you know, it's um, it's going to it's going to be a struggle. I think. My, my friend Al yeah. Anderson, who we've done a couple of podcasts with, last year was a season ticket holder to the Indians. So he told me the other day he got a, uh, a a letter from them. If you send us a picture, we'll make a cardboard cut out of you. <laughs> oh, boy. That's... Boy. Uh, I mean, what do you have to do to, to, what do you have yeah. to do to get that? How, do, you have, do you have to pay? Or I have no idea. He, he, yeah. uh, he declined the offer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he probably, it's, it's, uh, that's weird. I mean, that's too weird. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it must be, it must be strange, really strange for players who, you know, to be playing in empty ballparks. Or, oh, probably, although yeah. there, are, there are some fans starting to creep into parks. Uh, I've seen that, and there are, uh, right. uh, yeah, and then there are some NFL teams who are going to allow up, allow up to seventeen thousand fans and uh, stuff like that. I don't know. I don't know whether that's going to fly or not. Uh, you know, I'm making a prediction again, which may be very bold, but I don't think this could be an NFL season. Uh, I'll be very surprised, even more surprised than I would was that there is a baseball season, but. Football is a sport, really, where I don't know how you can possibly control it uh, with, with, you know, 60-man rosters and a lot of, you know, taxi squad players and, you know, you know locker room stuff and so forth. And on the field, you know, really, you're facing down linemen or you're a defensive lineman late in the game and you're not wearing a mask and you're right across from each other. I don't know. It doesn't bode well to me. Well, they, they're all in training, all these teams are in training camps. Because uh, every day in the paper here, there's uh, stuff on the uh, <clears throat> Jets and Giants that I don't read. Because yeah, it's a, this whole tra- training camp BS. And uh, so far as I know, the Jets and Giants and uh, the Meadowlands and uh, the Eagles are banning fans from the games. But football is yeah. a bigger television sport anyway. Yeah. And the, the basketball and hockey are playing in bubbles. They're playing in bubbles, and, and hockey particularly is doing very well. Yeah, well, it's in, uh, every game is in Canada. Yeah, they're all in Canada, and they're playing in only two cities, Toronto and Edmonton. And uh, it's I think it's, you know, I said this before, that, I think hockey is going to come out of this season the winner uh, as far as uh, get, gaining more uh, fan support and more attention to their playoffs and uh, more power to them because they, they, they've done – they made a really, really very, very shrewd move in well, playing in only the two Canadian cities. The NBA uh, is playing all their games in Orlando. Uh, yeah. And uh, early, when they resumed early, <clears throat> this uh, uh, Clipper, Lou Williams, left without authorization. And they thought when he came back, they'd find his ass. Hmm. They'd find him. Yeah. We don't see that anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's. Yeah, well, it, I, they've. It's, they're in the playoffs, so the NBA has a pretty good shot, I think, in making it through the season too. And um, yeah, you know, the, the playoffs is, teams are taking. They'll take it. I, I put out a few times on on Facebook that the only reason that baseball is playing is because the owners stood, stood to lose a fortune if there was no postseason. Yeah, they have to yeah. give the money back to the uh, 
stations, and then the stations have to give back the advertisers. The, the, yeah. the, the, the thing that the uh, uh, CBS wants five and a half million dollars for a thirty-second spot in the Super Bowl. Wow! Yeah, that's a lot of money. It is a lot of money, and particularly when you know you don't even know if there will be a Super Bowl, and yeah, that, that's incredible. I think they'll mow through. They mow through to you. The two years that they had strikes in 1982 and 1987. Are they, are they, you, you would know this better than I. Do, you, are they, do they have the package this year of all major league games? Can you, can you watch all major league games if you, I don't know what they yeah, put well, they cost. Uh, Yeah, it's supposedly through the MLB uh, <clears throat> site. But the thing is, is that, uh, you know, I can't bring myself right now to watch very much. Yeah. And also, yeah. the, uh, you know, I, it's also my belief that there, each team has at least three pitchers that have no business being in the major leagues. Yeah. Yeah. It's, no, it's... Um, but yet the hitting, hitting, hitting is is pretty far down across the board. It's not just Pete Cleveland and Pittsburgh and a couple other teams. Uh, you know, I don't know where I haven't looked at any batting leaders or anything like that. So you may know better than I who's no, I know, I know. I can't look at this too much. Yeah, but the Mets have yeah. the worst uh, batting average as well as the scoring position. Yeah, that's yeah, and it's. Yeah, Cleveland's is Cleveland's down there too with runners in scoring position, but of course they are because they don't hit with it with them on or with them not on. So I'm sure uh, the strikeouts are higher than the hits. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Carlos Santana up until this weekend, you know, the last few games had more than twice as many walks as he did hits. Uh, the only one who's ever done anything even close to that for a full season is Barry Bonds. And uh, very bond to circumstances, we'll just say were quite special uh, when the year in which he did it. Uh, and Santana was batting below 200 and had an on-base percentage of up around 400. Uh, it was crazy. And um, it'll be interesting to see what develops in the second half of the season, whether some of these teams that are really down there and whether they'll even – be able to hold their rosters together. Guys will just say, look, I don't want to run the risk. We're out of it and find somebody else to play for me because I just don't want to take any chances the rest of the way. And I think some of them would be within their rights to do so, although they would for- forfeit certainly part of their salary. Yeah, well, uh, I think there's 20 players, uh, 20 players who have opted out over the yeah. time. And one of them is the Mets, you know, on a Cespedes, who hasn't hardly played in the last three years. So I put I down, know. this guy put the post out. I said, he's been, he, he's been uh, dropping out for the last three years. Yeah. That's, but, that's uh, and there, there are players on that who are perpetually hurt. Yeah, when you're in, and when you're in, the, you know, when, now if you're hurt, you miss. You know, even if you're only on the ten day, DL, I mean, you're missing one sixth of the season. Not, you know, and if you're on the, you know, if you're on a longer, a longer stint, uh, you're you're not you're not even going to be a qualifier. If you do happen to hit three eighty five or four hundred, uh, you might not have enough plate appearances. I don't know what the qualifying number is going to be. Uh, they may have to take into account the teams who played only 56 or 55 games are, are going to have to have a lower number of qualifying appearances. I think it's 60 times three and a half. Which 60 is like, times uh, three and a half. So that would be... 190 one, or something two, like that, two, yeah. Two, well, 210. Uh, yeah. That, yeah, 60 times, 180 times 30. Yeah. Plus 30 is... Uh, Two ten plate appearances, and but if you only play fifty five games, 
I think there has to be some um, dispensation there. And so that a player who's hitting 360 with only 55 games and the season only played 56 games uh, would get some would get something toward, you know, to, uh, some well, maintenance. A number there. of people fear is that uh, uh, somebody's going to hit 400 and then they're going to get it in the record books as listed as a 400 hitter. Yeah. Which I don't I, think is, hopefully it's not, that's not going to happen. I hope not. No, I don't see that happening. I don't, I don't see any, yeah, I don't see any records being threatened except for uh, stuff like the White Sox 1906 record for lowest team batting average by a World Series winner. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, there, there are other teams that hit down there, too, in those years. Uh, yeah, they didn't win the dead ball era, but they didn't win, they didn't win the pennant. Yeah, pitchers uh, need 60 innings to qualify for the ERA. 60 innings, okay. One per game. That could be... That. That could be reduced too if teams only play, you know, games yeah. for some for some teams anyway. And uh, uh, you know, before 1950 and before, the qualifier for the ERA was ten complete games. Right. And um, there's that still was some left out of existence for, by, by this by this uh, the way they use these guys. In fact, the Jim Hearn of the yeah, you know, of the Giants. What was uh, the Phillies when this happened? He, oh, he yeah. had two things. He had in 1950 he led the ERA nationally League with 134 innings pitched, but he had 11 complete games. And then yeah. after after he he, reti- he lost the game a couple of months after he retired because one yeah. of those uh, Philadelphia suspended Sunday games. Yeah. They, they, yeah. The Pirates couldn't start after an inning after seven, and then he was retired, and then. The, Game was resumed, and he was charged with the loss. <laughs> I yeah, think that's a, pretty impressive. It was. It was yeah. Another quirk too, and uh, it was, I believe it was 1940 when uh, Ernie Bonham was a late season call up by the Yankees, who were contending, as they called him up earlier, and might have taken the 40 pennant along and made it like you know eight straight or what a seven straight or eight straight pennants if they had one that year. They called him up late in the season, and he pitched 10 complete games and had the lowest ERA in the American League, but he pitched fewer than 100 innings. So at some point, they realized this is ridiculous, so we're going we're gonna to take this away from Bonham. But a couple of years later, Howie Paulette with the Cardinals, in only about 130 innings, had 10 complete games, and they gave him the ERA crown. So I, it's still listed that way in baseball ref, I, I think. Uh, some redress has to be made at some point with some of these. Uh, well, before they went to uh, leaders, yeah, you know, the the bats probably because of Ted Williams, because that year he had 1954, he would have wanted to, to count the play appearances because he walked so much. I know, but there, there were guys like Bubbles Hargrave and Debs Garms, just to name a couple, that won by titles playing 100 games because that was a qualification back then. Yeah. I can understand why they made some, uh, you know, concession to the fact that catchers really were, you know, might had a much harder struggle reaching 400 at bats, which was then, you know, pretty much considered a credible number of at bats, them winning batting titles. But I, I can't understand why, you know, they had, you know, let Early Lombardi win it one year with 330 or something like that at bats, and uh, and they, you know, it's. It's, yeah, and and if Williams had won, had been credited with the batting title in '54, uh, it would mean that Cleveland has not had a batting title winner now in 76 years, because their last uncontested batting title winner was Lou Boudreau in 1944, and I thought you know Avila won it, but it's it's controversial. He really wouldn't have won it if today's rules had been in effect. So it's. Yeah, history. You got to be. You have to be beware that there are all these hidden, hidden nuggets when you start researching some of this stuff. Uh, it's funny because somebody posted. Uh, I'm also in a couple of Giants, old Giants, New York Giants. Uh, I'm in a lot of groups on Facebook. I'm in a, lot, a few New York Giants, and they, one of them they posted. Uh, uh, a picture of uh, Louis Mays and Bobby Avila before the 54 series. 
So I put down William Mays went on to a Hall of Fame career. And Bobby Avila, he really declined rapidly. Two years later, he was hitting 224. Yeah. And he wound up as uh, one of the seven second basemen that tried to, uh, that but couldn't replace the Red Shanes in 1959 yeah. with the Braves. I know. Yeah. yeah, that was that was a shame because I think the, I think the Braves were the better team that year, and they, they should have probably gone to the yeah. series. But. One of the things I I, uh, I did an analysis years ago. With Joe McCarthy he says greatest manager, blah blah blah. It's very good at wearing pants by large margins. But he talk, the five times he was a, a race that was very close. Two of them with the Red Sox, three with the Yankees, and they, they lost each time. And they in did. 1940, if you 1940 look at the, was one of them. Yeah. yeah you, you look at the lineup in 1940. In uh, fact, yeah. Cassetti is playing the whole year at shortstop. Yeah. And 194, I think it was. And yeah, Rizzuto was, was probably. Yeah, Rizzuto was in Kansas City. Yeah, he could have. He could have. He could have. Uh, yeah, he was having a good year. They could have brought him up. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I never liked. I never thought of McCarthy as. I always, you know, the push button manager labels was, as a kid, I was, I was, that was the way he was always identified. For, and I remember him that way, being identified only as a push button manager. And everything I've read about him and everything I've studied since indicates that uh, whoever gave him that nickname was right on target. Uh, that McCarthy, although he did win a pennant with the Cubs, or an earlier pennant with the Cubs in 29. Uh, I think that was a little, you know, that was nice, but it, it certainly wasn't uh, a Matt alone going to get him into the Hall of Fame. And if he hadn't been hired to manage the Yankees, I don't think he would have even seen Joe McCarthy managing in the majors as late well, as uh, 19. The Red Sox historians do not have a very high opinion of him. Oh, they, yeah. Uh, so, so they, because he, he didn't like rookies. Uh, yeah. They started, and Parnell had a very good rookie year. Started the uh, Gale House in a playoff game against the Indians. Bay Gale House, and he got rocked. He got rocked. Yeah, I. Yeah, he could have. He could have. Uh, yeah, he had his choice, and um, I don't. The team certainly wasn't behind the choice. I don't. He didn't. I don't think he called on anybody for input on who he was going to choose for a starting pitcher. I remember Bobby. I think it was we were in San Diego when Bobby Dorr talked about it. Yeah. And uh, Dorr said that everybody was kind of, was caught by surprise when he named Gale House, and um, nobody really had any understanding of why he picked Gale House, uh, except that he was a right-handed pitcher, and uh, the Indians would there be thereby be forced to play Eddie Robinson, you know. It first, if they played Allie Clark at first base, they put up put, started Mel Parnell, and they did play Allie Clark sometimes at first base. A right-handed hitter, he had the Green Monster favorably, uh, you know, ready there for him. Whereas if they started a right-hander, uh, you know, they had to play Eddie Robinson, who didn't have the home run power that year that Allie Clark showed just in the, you know, limited time he played. Uh, it wasn't much of an excuse, and uh, I don't think anybody really bought it. But that was the only reason it made even the least bit of sense. Yeah, those Red Sox teams may have been the best collection uh, of players who never won a pennant. Yeah, yeah, they uh, yeah they they could have been they could have they, they certainly should have won they could have won in '48 easily, and they definitely should have won in '49, and. Um, you know, McCarthy just wasn't no. wasn't the guy to have as it had at your at the wheel then. He, he left there in 1950, I think, mid season. Yeah. Or Steve yeah. O'Neill. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I, I don't know why Yawkey brought him in in the first place. I think that was a dumb move. There were there yeah. were guys that they, but it was a, it was in those days they rarely hired somebody out of nowhere. They you know, they just recycled. Guys like Bucky Harris over and over again. Oh, uh, and Charlie Green. Yeah, the National League. Were, uh, Frankie Frisch. And, yeah, yeah. And, they recycled Charlie Dressen. They recycled yeah. Bernie Tebbets. 
Yeah. Uh, and there's probably a few others that uh, are not coming to mind right away. Well, Tubbett's actually, I think, was a good manager. He just never really had a, a team that could win. And Paul Richards, I think, was a great manager. And with the, with if Paul Richards had been with Cleveland instead of Al Lopez in the 1950s, I think the Indians would have won three or four pennants. Paul Richards uh, was very under, good at turning nothing into a second or third place team. But yeah. he never went over the hump. So, uh, but, he never, but he never had the team. He never had the team. And, you know, those go-go White Sox teams, and you look at them, uh, they were strung together, and they all had big flaws. Then he went to the Orioles, and uh, by the time the Orioles did have a winning team, they already canned him. And he moved on to Houston, and he built a very good. He built, he built decent teams with Houston, but he just never got with the right ball club, and it, it's kept him out of the Hall of Fame, which I think is a shame. But I think he may have been even a, a, the best manager in that era. Yes, but some uh, just never had the best team. Oh, some uh, well, I have a book that was written about him called The Wizard of Waxahachie. Yeah, that came was written by Warren. Years. Yeah, it was an, ex- of years an excellent book. Warren Corbett, yeah. who who uh, really knows his '50s players and managers, he wrote a tremendous biography on George Crow. Uh, that if you get a whole, you know, you have to read it. It really, really tells you how Crow was cheated of what uh, should have been um, a long baseball career, not just as a player, but as uh, front office and even as the league president and uh, all kinds of things that Crow should have should have been recognized for. It never he was never was given a chance. And uh, Cor- Corbett is very good. So that that was a, a great biography. Well, that's part of the Saber biographies. Yeah, he is. Yeah, it, it, the crow crow is in there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really he, worth he, anybody getting a. He copy played of a it. couple of years of pro basketball. Yeah. <laughs> Richard this, was quite this, a guy. This is before yeah. this is before the NBA. The two leagues, yeah. the, and, 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 the BAA. With, with, you know, the Celtics and Knicks and Warriors ran in something called the National Bas- Basketball League, where yeah. most, of the, most of these teams were in the, in the Midwest. And, and Crow had a very good high school basketball career. I think it was, you know, he may have even been considered the most valuable high school basketball player one year in Indiana. Uh, and... Uh, he had a, he could have probably made it, but the NBA was even tougher than the N, N, A, and Major League Baseball than the crack if you were, if you yeah. were black. So Crow, I mean, you know, there, there were a few guys uh, like Sweetwater Clifton who did make it, and uh, Detroit had a guy named Earl. I can't remember his last name. Earl Lloyd. Name. Earl Lloyd, exactly. Yeah, he was, yeah. yeah. And uh, and but he was on and, Syracuse uh, originally. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and Boston had uh, Chuck Cooper. Yeah, but that was there was that, I, there really were very very few blacks in the game. Yeah, the last even into the, the fifty-seven, fifty-eight St. Louis Hawks were the last uh, all-white team to win the NBA title. And I don't think really. It, it, yeah, I don't think they're ever going to be replaced. <laughs> <laughs> no chance. No. Yeah, it's. Uh, Wow, yeah, that, that's a that's an that's an interesting observation. I never I never really thought of taking a look at that. Yeah, and in football, it's the Detroit Lions, nineteen fifty three Detroit Lions, nineteen fifty three Lions. Yeah, and uh, uh, and the uh, baseball is the nineteen fifty three Yankees, and the nineteen fifty nineteen fifty series with the Yankees and the Phillies, the last all white uh, both teams. Yeah, all white worlds. Yeah, yeah, that I did know. I did know, uh, yeah, uh, because both of those teams are very low to take black players. Uh, yeah, there's or, a uh, book I have which goes team by team. Very fascinating, even though it's a McFarland. Uh, they go team by the team integration, team by team, and they go in the order they integrated. Yeah. So, so the Dodgers are first, and the Red Sox are last. They only did this for yeah. the original sixteen, you know, not 
Yeah, for yeah. Uh, expansion teams. Yeah, well, they, I think the expansion teams all all started out with black players in their first year. I'm, 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 I'd be very surprised if, not, if any of them didn't. Uh, so, yeah. I, oh, I hated Jackie Robinson as a kid, not because he was black, but because he was a Dodger. Yeah, when well, he's also very good. Yeah, yeah I know, yeah, but uh, I... Yeah, yeah. I used to, I used to, well, we used to compare this because when I grew up, everybody, every kid was from Brooklyn or the Bronx. I was from the Bronx, and uh, I would argue that Joe Collins was better than Joe Hodges, even though I knew it was nonsense. <laughs> that was a tough one to make. Yeah. Joe Collins, he, he had that right field porch, and that was about all he had to look at. And, but he but he lasted a long time. Yeah, it lasted ten years. Yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing. You look back, most people have forgotten him completely. But he did hit those home runs in Yankee Stadium, just enough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, what's his name? Uh, Tommy Burns. <laughs> the first thing I ever knew about Tommy Burns when I got his '52 Tops card, and uh, uh. With, with him being a St. Louis Brown. And next year, he's a White Sox. And when the Yankees brought him back. Yeah. Yeah. Stengel was very opposed to him being traded. But the orders to get him traded came from the uh, owners who couldn't stand watching him. I know. Well, Stengel couldn't stand watching him either. Mm-hmm. That was, you know, Stengel, you know, he, he, he had real, you know, if you look at Burns' 1948-1949 season, they are amazing. He, the, the number of hits allowed in each year for that era, just incredibly low. Just he was also up there on walks. Yeah, but the, way of course he had walk. a, yeah, yeah. way up there in walks. And, uh, but his overall, I mean, you consider everybody was up up there in walks in those years 49 48 49 50 49 for some reason the walk total yeah 49 yeah. the walk total were through the roof they'd never been that way be, before or since and burn was certainly caught in that and a and a big victim of it but uh the only team, surrendered the only team in the american league if i remember correctly i haven't looked at this in a while in 1949 that had more strikeouts than walks with the Tigers, and it was a very low number. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, but then you have the, yeah. the other side of the coin is in 1951, Vic Rashi led the American League in strikeouts with 164. Yeah. So yeah I first there, saw there that, were, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Yeah, there were there were a lot of there were a lot, a lot of guys led uh, with numbers in the in the 100s, in the 40s and 50s, and even in the 30s. And twenties, Lefty Grove is first year led in strikeouts. I think with only 128 or some ridiculous wow. number, uh, and uh, he, w- he went on to lead the league in strikeouts every year for I think the first six years. But his totals were very modest and for a pitcher today. They wouldn't even be given a second look. Uh, any of them. One but of the funniest. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Then they were. You know, he really, he really, uh, he stood out. I mean, you know, he was considered. You know, you know, the hardest pitcher to you know to hit, but uh, it's it's one really of the things. Do I hear a quick story? When I got yeah. the first t- right. first Tuckum Thompson, that my parents gave it to me for my ninth birthday in 1952, or tenth birthday 1953. I'm not sure. So I have a trivia thing in the back, and one of the questions is. What team set the record for most double plays? It's the 1949 A's. 49 and A's. then I was looking through, uh, years ago I was doing a deep study on the uh, walks and strikeouts by batters. And the Philly pitchers, the A's pitchers, had five guys, had five guys who walked over 100 batters. Yeah. It was the only time there that's there ever was, been done, yeah. Yeah. There were, but that's why so, they set the record in double plays. Of course, of course. Yeah. They had a decent infield. Ferris yeah. Kane was a very good fielder. Sure. And Juice was Juice was yeah. good. And uh, Pete Sula was one. I think they had Maj- they? I think they had Majeski on third. And, yeah, they had they had a number of players there. Yeah. Suter at second, and Suter was a good fielder. And Juice was was 
was a very good, very good and underrated player. He uh, he had a second career after World War. No, he was he terrible. Yeah, he was with the uh, yeah, yeah, it was early in his career. But he came on and he had and he had power. He had power as a leadoff hitter with the A's, and he got a lot of walks. And uh, I thought it was very underrated. You know, there's too many good shortstops in. There was Boudreaux and Marion and Pesky and Vern Stevens and. You know, everybody had somebody who pretty much the Dodgers had Pee Wee Reese. And, uh, so there were a lot, a lot of really good shortstops, and G's got lost in the shuffle. When all I forgot, I forgot Pee- Rizzuto. <laughs> oh, Rizzuto, yeah, yeah, who was MVP. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, uh, you know, shortstop was a loaded position in those years. Yeah, and the uh, thing is, one, uh, in the top, Ten of top twenty, an all-time on base percentage. Who is Ferris Fain? Oh yeah, Fain. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. He won two batting titles. Yeah, I know. They traded him because Connie Mack didn't want to pay him. Didn't want to pay him, and he wasn't. He, he, he didn't have. He didn't. He wasn't a power hitter. I no. really like power hitting first baseman in those years, like Walt Dropo. And, I tried uh, to Eddie Robinson. And Fane got Fane got hurt, and you know, yeah. pretty much wrecked his career, and was never the same player. But uh, he had a very, you know, for for the, his first five or six seasons in the majors, he was a very strong first baseman, excellent fielder. I remember watching him, and you know, I was playing first base in those years myself, trying to be. You know, to learn when I went to games from what guys were doing, and fame being left-handed was hard to learn from for one. But just watching some of the stuff he did at first base, the acrobatics, what he, especially on low throws or wide throws, was really. And he wasn't very big. I don't. I don't even think he was six feet. He might have been about five ten. And uh, he, he was incredible to watch. I really loved watching those A's, at those A scenes with Juice and Fame. And, well, I don't know. Uh, did you ever see another one from me who had a very strange career was uh, Bob Dillinger? Yeah, Dillinger wasn't a good fielder and wasn't a good wasn't a good guy. wasn't wasn't a good clubhouse guy. Uh, it was a moody kind of a you know grouchy and uh, but he was a good player. Uh, and he did kind of get the shaft. Because uh, he would hit 300 almost every year, and uh, he would still get almost on. He traded almost on for almost nothing. Uh, it was hard to understand why. What really Dillinger's problem was? I mean, somebody should have been able to figure him out and get something out of him. But I don't think he ever got with a team that was in contention. I mean, he did play with the White Sox for a while. But uh, they went for the, the only Browns. Was they had the biggest years were with the St. Louis Browns. Yeah, and he had, then he and he went with Pittsburgh for a while. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were, yeah, they yeah. were down, and he never got. He never really was with. His, I don't think he ever got the right manager or the right team, and because he was was a good ball player and he was fun to watch. And he, but he wore glasses too, and that was held against you in those days. Even though Don DiMaggio wore them. And, Dillinger wore them. There were very, very few players who wore glasses. Pitchers, some pitchers did. Yeah. But uh, you know, Constanti wore glasses. So but, Walt Masterson. Walt Masterson. First guy I ever yeah. got him. He had sunglasses on. Yeah. Yeah, but he. he uh, but there were very, you know, there were very I few. Feel, yeah. the, the history of the history of players wearing glasses in the major leagues is still yet to have been done. Because I, I've always contended there were guys in the 19th century who, who really lost uh, lost out in the bigs because their eyes started to go in them, and they couldn't afford to start wearing glasses on the field, even though they wore them off the field at times, because they would have been ostracized if they were position players. Will White got away with it because he was a pitcher, and there was even a one-eyed pitcher with Cincinnati in I think 1886, but. Uh, very, very few players wore glasses in those days. And you really didn't, you know, you didn't try to do it until actually Spex Torpeser and some of the pitchers like Lee, Lee Meadows and Carmen Hill did it in the teens and 20s. 
But until then, you know, Chuck Hafey was the first really first player of real substance outside of Will White to wear glasses. And that's the history of players wearing glasses is, would be fascinating. It would be great reading if somebody went, wanted to do it. There's something for young researchers really to tackle. There's a book there. Yeah, by the way, the first fame, uh, you know, was in the Pacific Coast League in 1946. And the A's bought him. And he, always, he said he had to take a cut in salary. But the San Francisco Seals out there the pay, yeah. would pay him more money than the A's. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't want to go. No. He did not want to go, particularly to the A's, because Mac was not a popular guy to play for, really. Yeah, I don't yeah. Well, we've seen all by then. Yeah, he was. He was. He didn't pay. They didn't. The A's didn't pay well, and uh, they'd been so many so long. But they're f- bringing guys like Fain aboard. Uh, their A's were in contention in '48. They were in serious contention throughout the first half of the season. They looked like they were going to stick around, but then they faded badly in the second half, and uh, were nowhere to be found in September. But up till then, they were they were in there, and that was the last decent team Mac really was able to put together. Yeah, it was the last team he managed. In 1952, yeah. they finished fourth. The chance had the yeah. chance had the big year, and the outfield was uh, uh, Buster on you and Dave Philly. Both of them they got from the White Sox. The Indians really took the beating on that trade. Oh, terrible! They gave up the no so and they got Lou Brissy. Yeah, it was horrible. And, right? uh, and uh, Elmer Vallow was the right fielder. He was around for a very long time. Yeah, yeah. They had, they did help. They did, they did sign some, sign some good ball players, and and they managed to keep them. Uh, which you know you could do that in those days. I mean, yeah, you know, reserve players, clause, of course, yeah. Yeah, the reserve clause. You, you know, if, uh, you didn't want to trade somebody, they didn't get traded unless they made a really, you know, made it impossible to keep them. And uh, the guys like Velo and, you know, McCoskey stuck around with the A's in some of his prime years. And, you know, even George Kell coming up, came up and signed with the A's. And yeah, George Kell was traded. Traded to the George from McCoskey, yeah. From McCoskey, yeah. And that was a bad, very bad back problem. Yeah. Uh, essentially yeah. the end of his career. Yeah, it did. He, he played in 48 at 328 without much power, without any power, really, you know? He had zero home runs. I don't know any. I think Rod Carew had a year like that. I don't know anybody who hit that high with zero home runs, and, and not in recent memory anyway. But uh, and then, then McCoskey over the over the over the winter tried to bulk up. He had a rowing machine in his basement, and he overdid it, and he came to spring training, that, yeah. and he blew out his back in spring training, and almost the first or second day of spring training. He just he, he had overdone, overdone something, and uh, he, he slipped in a disc or something went out, and, and he never really he was out all 40, uh, 48, 49, and that was it. Came back as a pinch hitter, part timer, and he was a pretty good pinch hitter, but didn't have enough left to ever. Another ever brilliant move. Really. Another brilliant they move. They move. They did after nineteen forty nine. They traded Nelly Fox to the White Sox for Joe Tipton. <laughs> yeah, that was a <laughs> yeah. And yeah it's funny because there's a number of yeah. stories. Uh, the most expensive in those days, the most expensive backup catcher was Aaron Robinson because the Yankees sent him to the White Sox in the Eddie Lopez trade, and then. The White Sox traded him to the Tigers, and the Tigers gave him the choice of Ted Gray or Billy Pierce. Yeah. The White Sox made the right choice. <laughs> they, they did. They yeah. did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and the White Sox had Sherman Lowe. So the yeah, they, oh, he was with the and, Browns. Yeah. He was the Yankees the Browns. The also. Yeah. Yeah. Later with the – later with the – yeah. But, uh, yeah, those are some – yeah. Talking about Mac could consume a whole yeah. podcast by itself. Some I know, weird yeah. Stuff that, yeah it's, but we'll get to that one day. Okay. And, yeah, it's it's been a really really fun talk. 
you know, Thank today. You, I really enjoyed this. We appreciate it. And uh, let me uh, sign off, and we'll talk very soon. Thanks, Dale. Real okay, pleasure once talk. again. It's always a pleasure with me. Take care.